Hey Calvary, it's exciting to see you. Glad you tuned in to join us for our final week of online only here at Calvary Sweetwater. And uh, wherever you're joining us from, we're glad to have you and hope that God is working in your life. Hey, I'm going to invite you to take your Bible or your Bible app and turn to Acts chapter 2, the book of Acts chapter 2, as we're continuing our series looking at the early church. Uh, just how God started the church, how the church operated, functioned, how God worked in tremendous ways, and, and thereby how we as followers of Jesus need to live today. Uh, hey, before you uh, uh, get settled in and start listening, let me just remind you that later in the service, actually during the sermon, we're going to be taking communion. So uh, if you've got uh, some communion elements ready, whether that's bread or cracker, juice or wine, uh, just grab that and have it close at hand because in a few minutes we're going to stop and we're just going to celebrate Jesus' death and resurrection together. Hey, I don't know if you know this or not, but there are between 350,000 and 400,000 Christian churches in the United States of America. And they are all different kinds of shapes and sizes and styles and theologies and practice. But here's the thing they have in common. Practically every one of them believes that they do church the right way. They do it correctly. Uh, I know this because I grew up in one of those. Uh, I grew up Southern Baptist. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Calvary is technically a Southern Baptist church. Uh, but I grew up in Southern Baptist churches that taught we were the true church. We were the ones who got it right. We were more correct than everybody else because we were biblical. And, and, uh, and of course, they encouraged me to read the Bible. I encourage you to read the Bible. And, and, and when I read the Bible, I discovered that they taught a lot of biblical truths that really helped shape my life and change my life. But uh, everything we did uh, wasn't really biblical. There was a bunch of stuff that uh, we said you can't do or you have to do that wasn't even in the Bible. For instance, I told you I grew up Baptist, and so, you know, there was no dancing. Dancing was a sin. But, you know, Psalm 150 tells us to praise God with the dance. A little tension there. Or how about no drinking? Uh, I grew up where, you know, the churches actually read a statement saying we're going to abstain from the sale and use of alcohol, Period. We're not going to touch it. We're not going to drink it. We're not going to sell it. We're not going to do anything with it. Did you realize that in the Gospel of John, second chapter, the first miracle of Jesus was he turned the water into wine? Seriously, how did they miss that? And, and then, of course, we were Baptists, so there was never any hand raising or clapping in church. It just wasn't proper. But Paul told Timothy to lift up holy hands when you pray. That the Psalm, Psalm 47 says, clap your hands, all you people. Shout to the Lord with a voice of triumph. There was never any shouting in church when I grew up, unless of course it was a business meeting and people were mad at each other. So uh, they tried to tell me that we were doing church correctly uh, and uh, I questioned it because we were doing a lot of stuff that wasn't biblical. And we were prohibiting a lot of stuff that actually was biblical. So uh, we're studying the book of Acts, Acts of the Apostles. And, and last week we talked about Pentecost. Pastor Joe shared about the Holy Spirit coming and, and how the church was born and 3,000 people were saved. 3,000 people confessed Jesus as their Savior on day one of the church. And, and so the church went from a, a group of about 100 to a group of over 3,000 overnight. And and what we're looking at today is the passage that describes how that early church did church. What they did as the body of Christ to function and operate as the people of God. And we want to learn from them and what they do. So Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 42 through the end of the chapter, tells us this. And they, they being the, the new Christians... Those 3,000 plus that were suddenly followers of Jesus. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, 
praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. That is a picture of the early church. And the recurring theme in this passage, I don't know if you, if you picked this up or not, was this. The early church was together. The early church was together. And that is so frustrating to me because we're not meeting together until next week. September 5th and 6th, we're able to reopen the Sweetwater campus. We're going to invite you in and welcome you with open arms if you want to be here, if you feel comfortable being here. If you're not comfortable worshiping in person yet, that's perfectly fine because we're going to continue live streaming the services. We're going to have them on demand for you. And we would love for you to be a part of Calvary any way you choose, whether it's at the Sweetwater campus, the Parker campus, or our online campus. So, uh, but we're frustrated because we're not together and I'm preaching this and I was hoping that we'd be together. But here's the thing. The early church was together. It's also frustrating to me because so many churches struggle with division. So many churches just can't get along. They fight about so many things. And here's the thing. We are adopted children of God. We're in the same family. We're described as the body of Christ. God wants us to be together. So let's talk about this. They were together in five distinct ways that are mentioned in these verses. Short passage, five different ways they were together. The first way that they were together was in the apostles' teaching. The apostles' teaching. Now, they didn't have a Bible to read. They had the Old Testament. They studied that, but they didn't have a Bible to read. How were they going to learn about Jesus? Well, the way they learned about Jesus was going and listening to Peter and James and John and all the other apostles teach about Jesus. The apostles walked with Jesus. They learned from Jesus. They watched Jesus. Uh, he, he instructed them and raised them up to be the leaders. Now they were passing on that knowledge of Jesus. So are you devoting yourself to the apostles' teaching? Now, we can't go sit at the feet of Peter and John, but we have the Bible, including the New Testament, which is the story of Jesus, and most of it was written by the apostles. Uh, by the way, that's why we want you to read the Bible. So you can know the truth of God, and the truth that can set you free can abide in your heart and your life. So uh, if we're going to do church like the early Christians, we must devote ourselves to learning God's Word. By the way, that's why we give Bibles away here at Calvary. We'd love for you to have a Bible. If you don't have one, we'd love to get one to you. If you don't have one and you're in Lake Havasu or Parker, come to one of our on-site campuses and, and just you can take one home with you. If you're a distance person, if you're joining us online campus, uh, just email us and we'll be glad to send you a Bible. We, we really want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you do that, God will change your life. That's why we post the sermons online. You can go back and listen to them again. You can go back and say the ones you missed, you can listen to on demand anytime you want because we want to offer you that instruction from the apostles so that you can learn about Jesus. So let me ask you this question. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Are you devoting time and energy to learning about Jesus? Well, you're tuned in right now, so yes, you are. Are you devoting anything beyond this time to learning about Jesus? So they were together in the apostles' teaching, and they were together in fellowship. Fellowship. Now, that is a biblical word, but it's a, really a church word. Because growing up in church, fellowship was the church word for party. Church never threw a party, because that was like of the world. And, but we had fellowship, and a fellowship was a gathering after Sunday night service. And, and there'd be food and desserts and games. Sounds a lot like a party to me. But we didn't call it that. But can I just tell you that fellowship is way more than a party? You see, fellowship is really about sharing your life with other believers. It's living in community. It's having, you know, redemptive relationships with people who love Jesus and serve Jesus like you do. And this is absolutely essential for you and me to be healthy followers of Jesus. And some of you right now are asking why. You're like, I don't need fellowship. I can watch, tune in from my couch. I can watch it in my pajamas. Uh, I can learn about Jesus. I'm good. No, we all need fellowship. The Apostle Paul said this. He goes, don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Now, he was really quoting Solomon because in Proverbs 13, Solomon said, whoever walks with the wise 
becomes wise. But the companion of fools will suffer harm. Do you get that? Whoever walks with the wise will become wise. Whoever hangs out with idiots, it, your, your life is going to crash. So which best describes your friend group? I mean, if you're watching this with your friends, don't say it out loud, but which best describes your friend group? Uh, are they people who are walking in wisdom or are they people who are encouraging you to walk away from Jesus? Because if you want to follow Jesus faithfully, you need to be surrounded by people who value Jesus and want to live out his values day in and day out. That is why life groups are so important to us here at Calvary. Because we all need connections in our lives that encourage us to follow Jesus, to learn and live the character of Jesus. And uh, by the way, we're going to have in-person signups for life groups beginning next week, September 5th and 6th. Okay, so next week you can sign up to be in a life group. If you're in a life group, you can continue being in a life group. If you aren't in a life group, you can say, hey, I want to be in a life group. And, and if you're part of our online community or you're not comfortable yet being in a group of people, we're going to have virtual life groups. And you can sign up on our website or you can email us at lifegroups at calvarylhc.com. And we will connect you to a group of people who, who share the values, who share the love, and who want to learn about Jesus. We want everyone in a life group because we believe all of us grow best in Jesus in the context of relationships. I'm in a life group, and it has been life-changing. All the pastors at Calvary are in life groups because we all need that fellowship, that relationship, that accountability, that encouragement with other believers. So I'm just going to challenge you. Will you choose to be in a life group? Uh, some of you are qualified to lead life groups, and if you're interested in doing that, you need, just need to go ahead and contact us at lifegroups at calvarylhc.com and start that conversation as well. So they were together in the apostles' teaching and fellowship and worship. They were together in worship. They broke bread together. Mentions that several times. Scholars generally believe that breaking bread together is celebrating communion. It's, it's taking the Lord's Supper. It's remembering Jesus' death and resurrection together. They were celebrating the grace of God that was expressed in the sacrifice of Jesus. And right now, whether you're watching alone or with your family or with your life group or a group of friends, uh, would you go ahead and pass out the elements that you have? The, the bread and the cup, whether it's uh, crackers and bread or whether it's juice or wine, doesn't matter to, to us, doesn't matter to God, because we want to stop and just remember Jesus' death and resurrection. Because in his death, he provided forgiveness of sins. In his resurrection, he shared with us the hope of eternal life, that promise that everyone who believes in Jesus will not perish but will have eternal life. And so we just want to take a moment and remember the love of God expressed in Jesus and say thank you to him for giving us eternal life in Jesus. Scripture tells us that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, he broke it, and he gave thanks. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. In the same way, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this in remembrance of me. Father, today we pause to say thank you. Thank you for loving us, even in our rebellion, and sending Jesus to be our Savior. Thank you that he was willing to take my sins and our sins and the sins of the world upon himself when he suffered and died on Calvary's cross. And Father, thank you that he was raised from the dead 
defeating sin and death and hell and, and delivering to us the hope of eternal life, that promise that one day we'll live in your presence forever. God, you have loved us. You have saved us. You have redeemed us. You have promised your presence with us. And today we want to worship you together as the people of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The early church was together. They were together in, in the apostles' teaching. They were together in fellowship. They were together in worship, celebrating Jesus' death and resurrection. And they were together in prayer. In prayer. Uh, it seems rather obvious. They mentioned prayer several times. They're praying together, praying for each other, offering up their prayers together. I don't know if you realize this or not, but, but we have a prayer team here at Calvary. And they want to pray for you. And when we have on-site worship, they're available at the end of every service to pray for you. And, and uh, in fact, right now, if you have a prayer need, you can just simply uh, click on the button that says, uh, I have a prayer need. You can submit that prayer need. Our online host will pray for you. Uh, but those prayer needs then are shared with our prayer team, and they're praying for you. If you're on site, you can simply fill out a prayer card and drop it in one of the offering boxes, and they'll pray for, pray for you. But I, also, our pastors all get those prayer requests, and we pray for you. Every time I receive a prayer request, I simply just take a moment and pray for whoever submitted it. Sometimes I know who they are, sometimes I don't, but it doesn't matter because I'm still lifting them up and our pastoral team lifts you up. Uh, and here's the thing, I hope you're praying for each other. I hope you're praying for each other. Uh, here's what we do in my life group. So, you know, our life group meets, we, we take prayer requests on a regular basis, pray for each other on a regular basis, but sometimes uh, we do a little bit beyond that. And a few weeks ago, months ago, maybe years ago, I don't know now, time has lost all meaning since uh, the coronavirus shutdown, hasn't it? But, uh, but we shared members of our families that needed to find Jesus. And we began praying for each other's family members, siblings, children, parents, uncles, aunts, friends, you know, whoever that they, they wanted us to pray for. And, and we began praying for each other and still do that. And we're waiting for that day we can rejoice together in God's answered prayer for our loved ones. You see, the people of God are together in prayer. Uh, and, uh, and if you see me or, or really any of our pastors out and about or even here at church, and you mention that you like prayer, we're going to pray for you right then and there. Right then and there. I mean, we do it in the sanctuary here at Sweetwater all the time, whether it's inside or in the foyer. But if you stop me in Walmart or in Safeway or Smith's and you say, hey, Pastor Chad, I need you to pray for me, I'm going to pray for you right there. I know it might embarrass some of you. It doesn't matter to me because God's with us and we want to pray for you. We want to intercede for you and lift you up. We take prayer seriously. So the early church was together in prayer and the early church was together in generosity. Uh, now, that passage may make some of you a little bit uncomfortable because it says they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And they shared all these things in common. Can, can I just clarify that the early church did not practice socialism? They, they weren't practicing socialism, and I know that because they were voluntarily sharing what they had to meet the needs of others. They offered it up to God so that other people's needs could be met. They chose to be generous. Now, one of the reasons I believe that the United States of America is the greatest nation on the face of the earth is our history of generosity. As a nation, we have been incredibly generous, the most generous nation in the world by far. And uh, in 2016, last year that we have data for, private citizens in the United States of America donated $390 billion to charity. That, that includes churches and nonprofits, and 63 million Americans volunteered their time. See, one of the reasons I believe God is blessing Calvary is our generosity. We bless those in need. We bless teachers. We bless police officers. We bless first responders, school districts, families, special, people with special needs. We, we just are intent on being generous as a church. So let me tell you what that looks like in, in just straight up numbers. Okay, last year, 
The last 12 months, Calvary has given over $750,000 to mission causes. $750,000. We're talking over three quarters of a million dollars that you guys have provided uh, to do things like build wells in Africa for people who don't have fresh water, to, to provide food for kids in Honduras, to train nurses, uh, not only to treat people's bodies, but to share the gospel of Jesus Christ in Thailand. And, and, and way beyond that, you're supporting thousands of missionaries with other churches through, through your gifts, three quarters of a million dollars. But that's worldwide. What about locally? Part of that money goes local, Lake Havasu City and Parker. In the last 12 months, you gave over $170,000 to the communities of Lake Havasu City and Parker. You go, what do we do with that money? Well, a lot of it went to families in need, people who needed food, people who needed auto repairs, people who needed help with their rent, people who needed help with utilities. But it also went to support uh, organizations in our communities, like pregnancy care, uh, Hospice of Havasu, Cooking for Cancer, uh, Serve Our Schools. We invested heavily in that. Teacher Appreciation, we, we hosted Night to Shine. We support Special Olympics, Faith and Grace Domestic Violence Shelters, and many, many others. You see, we're invested in the lives of people through our generosity. We want to give away as much as we can. And, and that is near and dear to our heart. I praise God for Calvary's generosity. But that means I got to ask you, are you practicing biblical generosity? Uh, I read an interesting thing that said that 80% of Americans describe themselves as generous, but only 60% actually donate anything to charities. <laughs> it's kind of a disconnect. So let me ask you this question. Do you want to give more or do you want to give less? It's a question of the heart. It, it, it really reveals to you before God where your heart is. So those are the five actions that mark that earliest church, that earliest Christians, how they functioned, what they did together. They were together. They were together in the, in the teaching of the apostles. They were together in fellowship and worship and prayer and generosity. And, and here's the, the good news that I want to share with you. They did all that and the result was life change. The result was life change. Look at verse 40, 47 again. They were praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Day by day. They saw life change happen day by day. You see, when we live as God intended, when we function as a biblical church, when we faithfully follow Jesus, then God shows up and he changes lives miraculously, radically, wonderfully. We know it, we see it, we experience it. And we've mentioned this before, but I, I, I just can't believe how God has worked during this coronavirus shutdown. I mean, since the middle of March when the, the COVID protocols went out and, and basically we haven't been able to do church like we used to do church, we have seen about 123 people profess their faith in Jesus Christ in baptism in a little over five months. It's not quite one a day, but you get the point. God is working. He's moving in people's lives. He's making a difference in, in how they live. And, and that is a miracle that is happening right before us. We're trying to show you that weekend after weekend after weekend, what God is doing day by day. You see, God is changing lives. And here's, here's the thing. God's changing your life. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, God is changing you. The Holy Spirit is in you, and he wants to make you more like Jesus. And not only that, but he wants to use your life to be a change agent for others. He'll do it too. If you decide you want to be like these early Christians. And we're in this together. Because we read about God doing it in Jerusalem. And we're seeing God do it in Lake Havasu City and Parker and to the ends of the earth. And I want to see him do it even more. So let me close with this question. 
Has your experience with Jesus resulted in life change? Because we don't want anyone just to be religious. We don't want anyone just to attend church. We want you to experience the life-changing power of Jesus Christ. And if you're desperate for that today, no matter what your church history has been, if you're desperate for God to change your life, would you ask him to do it right now? Uh, if you're watching online, then click the button that says, I want to follow Jesus. And, and then give us that information so that we can pray with you, so that we can encourage you, so that we can connect with you and share with you how you can take those steps to make Jesus Christ your Lord, your Savior, and experience that life change. Because God wants to do it. The Apostle Paul said, if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. He said, if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. The old has passed away. All things become new. That's what we're praying for for you and for the thousands of people that are in our communities and the millions that are in our country and the billions that are in our world because God has the power when we do this together. Let's pray. Father, you are a great and incredible God. And today we simply acknowledge your grace and your mercy that you have given us in Jesus Christ. And our, our request is that we could live as sons and daughters of God together in this mission for Jesus, celebrating your goodness, praying together, serving together, giving together, and seeing your power work miraculously in our lives, in our homes, and in our communities. This is our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. Let's continue to worship our Savior.